I swear, if I hear one more thing about ChatGPT for SEO, I swear I'm gonna rip my hair out. I think you're watching the wrong episode of the SEO Weekly because it's an elephant in the room and we are going to dive in. I'm talking prompts, I'm talking tools, I'm talking hot takes, all that, and so much more. I missed you, let's do it. Welcome back to the SEO Weekly, where queries are weird, advice is controversial, and everything depends. I'm your host, Garrett Sussman of iPollRank, and every week I cover everything going on in the world of SEO. We're talking Google updates, blog posts with strategies and tactics, podcasts, webinars, tools and feature updates, and what's going on in the social Twitter and LinkedIn community. You name it, I'm on it. And if you are into this stuff, please subscribe to our YouTube channel, give us a like, share on the socials. I genuinely appreciate it. We took a bit of a break. We've been off for a little over a month and a half, and a ton has happened. And it actually all started back at the end of November when ChatGPT was released. Boom. Big explosion taking the SEO industry by storm. In addition to that, we had an update to EAT and a couple of major rollouts in terms of algorithm updates. So let's start with Google. EAT, expertise, authoritativeness, trustworthiness. Basically, Google uses the quality rater guidelines to assess websites and ultimately determine if they are trustworthy, if they're authoritative, if they have expertise behind them, and Google wants to have the most high quality results appear at the top of your search results. So while they're technically not ranking factors, the Google raters, quality raters, are taking into consideration these elements, these site-wide signals, if you will, as to whether your content is quality. Well, Basically, on December 15th, they added a new letter to the acronym. It's now E-E-A-T. And the first E stands for experience. Now, what's experience all about? It differentiates in the sense that so much of the web just does research and throws out this fluff, these listicles, this garbage out there that's not actually based in any real life experience with what the user is querying. So Google wants to remedy that. They've been doing that with product reviews for the past year and trying to kind of tap into that. They did that with the helpful content update where they want content to be helpful. Well, one of these new quality signals is around experience. How has the article added an element of kind of information gain, new information that adds to what's expected in terms of the personal experience. So for instance, say in their example that you want to learn all about tax preparation, you're probably going to want to learn about that from someone who has experience preparing taxes as opposed to some blogger who's just kind of, you know, looking up a reference article, but doesn't actually know what that's like. On the other hand, there are other examples say, you know, you want information about tax software. You want to actually know what people's experiences are using that tax software. You don't want just the company to, to, you know, to read about what they say about themselves. You want to see what other experiences are like. So Implementing this uh, experience qualification in EEAT, they've updated the quality rater guidelines significantly to take into consideration this idea of experience. Whether or not that's implemented in the search results is still to be seen. The hope is the quality of the results will improve over time as articles or blog posts or, or whatnot include an obvious experience signal that shows that it's actually firsthand. Since the beginning of December, there were two algorithm updates that SEOs have been tracking. Now, as of last week, they had just completed rolling out. So the dust is actually still starting to settle as of the publishing of this episode. The first one was rolled out on December 5th, and that was the helpful content update. Now, remember from past episodes of the SEO Weekly, Google's now classifying the different algorithms as systems, and they make updates to the system. The helpful content system basically is a site-wide classifier that looks at 
every page on your site and deems whether the majority of content is helpful for users, for people who would search and find that content and read it. Is it helpful or is it unhelpful? Is it thin? Is it misleading? Is it trying to manipulate the search rankings just to rank high and not actually caring about the user? It's a site-wide classifier, so you're either helpful or unhelpful. And as you're classified, that ultimately is going to be a signal to influence how you rank across all of your different pages for a variety of keywords. The update, which just finished completing rolling out, gave uh, sites a chance to almost be reclassified. Now, this is ongoing. We don't know definitively like how often you're going to be, you know, reviewed reviewed by Google uh, algorithmically for whether or not your content is helpful or unhelpful. It's ongoing, but the second iteration kind of implies that everyone's kind of getting, getting reviewed a second time. The second algorithm that was rolled out on December 14th was a link spam update. So Google has its spam brain. It has a whole variety of tactics and techniques that they're looking for on your website to see if you're trying to manipulate the rankings with spam, whether that's like doorway pages or even AI generated content. Now, we're not going to get into that yet. We'll get into AI generated content and the spam there. But this one was specifically about links. So for instance, the whole idea of the PBN, you have a whole bunch of websites that are linked together strictly for the purpose of in uh, improving the internal links or the backlinks to your website that in theory would help you rank because links tend to be a, uh, a signal that you are a reliable source and worth, you know, ranking high in traffic. Now, historically, there's been thoughts that PBNs have been penalized. There's there's a lot of chatter in terms of how this uh, update is ultimately impacting your, your website, but definitely go to the Google Search Central documentation where they talk about all of their spam policies, specifically when it comes to link spam. For instance, buying or selling links for ranking purposes. This includes exchanging money for links or posts that contain links, exchanging goods or services for links, sending someone a product in exchange for them writing about it and including including a link, uh, excessive link exchanges, using automated programs or services to create links to your site, requiring a link as part of a terms of service contract or similar arrangement without allowing a third-party content owner the choice of qualifying the outbound link, text advertisements or text links that don't block ranking credit, advertorials or native advertising where payment is received for articles that include links that pass ranking credit, uh, low quality directory or bookmark site links, keyword rich hidden or low quality links embedded in widgets that are distributed across various sites, widely distributed links in the footers or templates of various sites, and forum comments with optimized links in the post or signature. So for example, thanks, that's great info, Paul. Paul's Pizza, San Diego Pizza, best pizza, San Diego. See the anchor text. So any sort of manipulative way where you can kind of manipulate the rankings specifically with links. Okay, and now for the biggest SEO story in the past month and a half and, and longer than that, we are potentially at a seminal moment in technology. We're talking, you know, the iPhone or the internet. We're talking AI content. And why is that? Well, November 30th, OpenAI releases ChatGPT, their research tool that allows you to provide a prompt and it will generate text based on whatever you're asking. Now, our own Mike King wrote an article all about why AI content is not a threat to SEO, but the fear among the community is that all of a sudden, everyone will start using AI content to generate a ton of spam, a ton of crappy content, and it's the end of the world. On the other side of things, people are absolutely thrilled to start using this technology in order to improve their strategy, to improve their content, to save them time, to allow them to scale, and to use it to improve their website performance. Now, either side of the spectrum, nobody's right and nobody's wrong. That said, I personally, my POV is that 
AI content, whether it's in the form of chat GPT or other tools that already existed like Jasper or Copy AI or what else is coming over the next three, five, 10 years, it's here and it's not going away. And it's something that SEOs need to put into their tool belt in order to continue to thrive in SEO. So I actually asked Mike, what his take was on AI content. Like, what is it? And and is it a bad thing? Mike, take it away. AI content is not inherently bad. Um, you know, I think that there's a lot of misconceptions because people don't really understand how it works, like most things in SEO. And of course, Google leans in with the fear, uncertainty, and doubt and saying like, oh, we're going to go after this or whatever. I mean, I, I don't know if they've explicitly said they're going to go after it. Um but nevertheless, I think that we are going to see them checking the bad stuff. And I believe that both the spam update and the helpful content update are steps in that direction. Not to say that those were the sites that necessarily got hit, because I haven't seen true evidence of that. You know, you, you hear people talking about in the in the SEO echo chamber. But the reality of these technologies and how they work is they emulate how we write. And so they determine the probabilities of the next word in the sequence based on learning from tons and tons and tons of writing across the web. And so that's inherently going to be difficult to, you know, definitively or uh, track without there being a lot of false positives and false negatives. So I'm very um, skeptical that you know these latest updates just came out and were able to identify that so perfectly that that is why people lost their rankings. Um, but I don't think those plat those tools are inherently bad, especially if you're using them in the right way and you're not just like spinning up a whole bunch of terrible content and throwing it right out on the web like people used to do with content spinners and things like that. And again, the quality of this copy is far better than what SEO is used to historically. So I don't think they're the boogeyman. I just think they need to be used in the right way to scale content creation. So to Mike's point, what's important is using AI content in the right way. And there are actually very reputable publications already doing it explicitly. Last week, Tony Hill called out that bankrate.com in the financial sector, CNET in technology, and creditcards.com in the financial sector all explicitly say that they have AI-generated content on their site. They have a little, you know, kind of notification that says AI-generated content, but, but, it's reviewed and fact-checked by the editorial team. So what was really cool is Kevin Indig actually looked into this. He did a little Google search and he found that Bankrate, for instance, which is dominating for financial keywords. So we're talking important, your money, your life types of uh, keywords, which you think would be scrutinized even more, had about 350 of these articles. And of these articles, a lot of them were ranking in the top three, uh, you know, for specific keywords. So ultimately came to the conclusion that at this point, these AI generated articles can rank really well. So I wanted to ask Mike to go a little bit deeper in terms of how you should be using AI content. What are those, you know, workflows that you should put into place? And, and here's what he said. So I think the visual content is such a new arena and is really cool. You know, there's a lot of opportunity for us to be generating more imagery with our content. And that's largely been, frankly, in SEO, like one of our debilitating factors with the content that we create in that it's not visual enough. Like so many people were just like, cool, 500 word blog post with the stock photo. Like that never cut it, you know what I mean? And so now we have the opportunity to be generating precisely what imagery we want to go with what it is that we're we're uh, putting out in the, the marketplace. Um, but on the written side, I mean, I think the whole thing is that you can't just generate it and dump it on the web because one of the things that these, that um, language models are really bad at is factual information, you know? And, and I talk about this in, in my blog post, um, 
where there have been some strides specifically with GPT-3 where they're trying to improve its ability to like give factual information. But the bottom line is it's always going to be hit or miss because again, it's a series of probabilities about what is the next word based on statistics effectively, not whether or not is actually true. So I say all that to say, you can't use large language models without editing the content that comes from them. And then when we start thinking about like optimization, you know, you still have to do that layer of, um, you know, using co-occurrence and entities and so on, if you want the content to be optimized. And so part of what I talk about in my blog post is like, you know, this idea of being able to generate perfectly optimized content at scale. We're not there yet. Like the components exist for all of this. You know, you got tools that identify entities, you got tools that identify co-occurrence, and then you've got this prompt-based language model stuff that can generate copy. If we put all that stuff together and then also in incorporated, you know, internal linking and things like that, then you can generate this like perfectly optimized content. But even then you still have to make sure it makes sense. It's accounting for your brand voice and tone. So that whole layer of editing still has to happen if you're going to use this stuff effectively. And then once you've edited it, well, how do you detect it? Because now you have a human who actually made adjustments to this copy, which was already generated by emulating humans. So what are you detecting? <laughs> so yeah, really it, just having, having that editorial layer is how you should be using this stuff moving forward. So when it comes to the detection of AI content, to some extent, that point is moot because as mentioned, Danny Sullivan said, they're not just looking for AI content to penalize. Uh, you know, they want the content to be helpful. That said, if you do want to actually check to make sure that your AI content doesn't come off as AI generated, there are a couple tools coming out that you can use to, to do that. For, for instance, originality.ai and GPT Radar are two tech based tools that you can use to evaluate whether Google would be able to tell if your content was written by a computer or a human. That said, chances are Google's tools are probably significantly more advanced than some of these, but at the same time, it's good. Maybe it gives you peace of mind. Mm -hmm. To the image portion of what Mike said, there are a lot of image tools out there to generate uh, AI images, which is really cool. Like Dali, uh, Mid Journey, uh, there's Dreamlike.art, there's even Canva has an integration now to create AI art. It's not perfect if you played around with it. You can't get exactly what you're looking for. You can continue to, you know, provide these prompts to get closer and closer, but you know, you can't get specific, like use Dolly, you can't generate words in Dolly the way that you want to quite yet. That said, prompt engineering is the next big thing. And that's what's really kind of taken over the SEO world. We've seen prompt suggestions all over the place. And some of the really cool things you can do with SEO. Mike, I'm curious, what is your take when it comes to the importance of prompting for these AI tools? Let's see what Mike had to say. Props are basically how you tell these large language models to generate content, right? Like some of them will be, you know, finish this sentence, basically. Uh, in other cases, you can say very specifically, hey, large language model, this is what I want you to do. And then it spits it out, right? And so really it comes down to how explicit you can be in explaining to the large language model, like, here's what I want you to do. Um, and you know, you're talking to a computer. So the more explicit you can be, the better you're gonna get at getting whatever it is that you want. And so, you know, just for more context, this just this doesn't just apply to uh the generation of copy, it also applies to the generation of images and, and large language models are what underpin a lot of these technology improvements that Google is making. So when you talk about things like mom, and I did a whole webinar on that, go check that out. Um, and then there's all these other things that Google is rolling out like Palm and, and Glam and all these other things. The, all of them are based on 
what they've learned by building these large language models. So prompt engineering is going to be something that I expect will touch on the SEO space when we start to realize like, hey, if you get good at this, you can engineer a lot of things without the need of people, whether it's, you know, um, you know, machine translation or again, like content creation in a variety of ways, video creation, uh, text to speech. There's so many different use cases that are going to become more popular, but are also getting more abstracted by the tools that are coming out. You know, like your copy AIs, your Jasper AIs, all these things that are built on top of GPT-3 and other language models and so on. But what we found in the work that we do for our clients is that when we work on this stuff at the base level of using those language models directly, we just get higher quality stuff anyway. So there you have it. Prompt engineering is a critical skill to learn, whether you're an SEO, a content marketer, a content producer, you name it. It's so important to learn how to communicate effectively with these AI content generation tools, whether it's text, images, even video, as Mike mentioned, you want to learn how to create a prompt and get the output that you're looking for. Now, one caveat, even though chat GPT is free right now, it's not always going to be free. So don't dedicate your whole strategy to learning this one tool. Also, as mentioned with Bankrate, CNET, and all of these editorial teams that are reviewing the content, and as Mike said, having that workflow in place, you need to make sure that you trust, but verify. You can get this output whether you're using the SEO for you know content creation or coming up with you know metadata or or schema or whatever you're using it for. Don't definitively think that it is going to be accurate because we already know that Chat GPT is factually inaccurate from time to time, and it was based on documentation from 2021. At least this iteration of the tool. Anything that's new, like prices or or any current events that have happened since then are not going to be incorporated into this answer. So let's dive into all the cool chat prompts and for AI content that have come out over the last few weeks that you can start using in your SEO workflow today. So with chat GPT being available for free and it penetrating the SEO community, you can only imagine how many examples of libraries and chat prompts and use cases that started to come out of the woodwork over the last few weeks. These were a few that really caught my attention that I thought were interesting that you can start using in your workflow today. First off, Technical SEO, Joe Hall put five different examples that you can use. So when you need to get some some code in there and and you don't want to do it yourself or you don't have the know-how, this is what he recommends. So first example is creating a static XML sitemap. Boom, so easy as opposed to having to use another tool using ChatGPT for that. Creating a JSON-LD schema for any sort of structured data to, you know, build up your entities and earn enhancements in the and visibility in the SERPs. Uh, crawl directives for robot.txt files. Some people don't like messing with robot.txt files, but you can use these accurate ones, these prompts that Joe's put together. Uh, creating robot meta tags and even redirecting URLs with a custom HT access rewrite rules. So some really cool technical use cases specifically for chat GPT, which has been pretty effective. Then uh, Andrew Shotlin of Local SEO Guide has grabbed a few more. He kind of does some technical ones as well as Uh, just content optimization and content in general. So even though some of these like technical ones like rewriting or writing a HT access file or robot.txt files are the same as Joe, his prompts are slightly different and may work better for you. But in addition, he had ideas around like generating quick breadcrumb navigation, HTML for web pages, uh, identifying schema markup, actually regenerating regex statements, generating frequently asked questions. And then one cool thing you can do from that is is once you provide the answers, doing the FAQ schema markup for those questions as well. If you're not using a tool like phrase.io and you want to do a comprehensive content brief, that's another really cool use case. Wouldn't it be cool if you could identify popular hashtags in your niche? Well, that apparently works as well. 
This one's creative. How about ask for image suggestions to make your content stand out? So Andrew has a bunch more of those. Check those out. And then finally, um, Aleda Solis, queen of SEO, obviously came up with a uh, 20 different really smart ones. Uh, a lot of her start around like segmenting keywords into different clusters, uh, classifying lists based on their search intent. I actually tried this with our own in-house at iPoll Ranks classification system. And one caveat, just remember, you need to trust but verify. It got about like 80% right compared to how I would do it manually. Who knows? Maybe, maybe chat GPT is better, but Go through it. It'll save you time because it can it can classify them really quickly without you having to manually go through it. But it's not always going to be perfect. There's some really interesting content optimization opportunity prompts from Aleda, whether it's generating titles for your page content, generating meta descriptions, having G chat GTP actually rewrite your content so there's no duplication. This is great if you work in local SEO and you have location pages where it's similar content, but you need it to be different. You could use chat GPT to rewrite all of those you know, obviously using whatever the, the location is. And so then it wouldn't just be this, this like duplicate content situation. And then we actually had a really interesting one all about the buyer's journey from Jill Patel. He posted this one on LinkedIn and carousels. And side note, off topic, have you noticed that LinkedIn carousels are kind of ridiculous? Well, that's one thing you'll definitely see lots of chat GPT examples uh, coming from these carousels. But his workflow is, is really smart. Basically, he said the steps for a good internal link strategy tied to the buyer's journey is all around grouping the URLs by topic, prioritize the user journey, create basic link strategy, and then use specific anchors, and then monitor and update your strategy. So step one, you submit your URLs and you ask to group URLs by topic. Then you prioritize and organize the URLs based on the user journey. And ChatGPT, as you can see, will kind of put this into a really nice table with the step description and then the, the redirect, redirected URL. Then step three, basic linking strategy, which can be edited for more specification. Anchor those selections. Uh, you know, as Jill mentions, he still trusts hrefs, but that's the whole trust but verify. And then step five, you know, keep in mind that you got to keep it coming back to it and expand the strategy and and you know merge this with your entity analysis for more understanding of each page. So that's a really cool use case. Then. Beyond SEO, if we are using this for content, there are some really interesting content opportunities. And there are a few that I wanted to point out. Okay, so there's this really cool collection from Area 11 all called Awesome Chat GPT Prompts. And what he does is he basically tells Chat GPT to act as different personalities before creating the content. So, you know, acting as a travel guide, acting as a plagiarism checker, acting as an Excel sheet, acting as an advertiser, acting as a storyteller. He goes through a variety of different verticals so you can kind of get that tone that mimics whatever that stereotype should be. Not only are there a ridiculous list of opportunity of different prompts to use here, but you can imagine it would, it would spur your creativity to come up with some of your own. Then another one was from Rob Lennon. Now, Rob was actually on Rankable gosh, back last year, way before any of this was happening, but he was on top of the AI content game. He was talking a lot about prompt engineering in that Rankable episode. Definitely check that out. But ever since ChatGPT has come out, he's been pumping out all sorts of amazing tips and tricks. In fact, I highly recommend you follow him either on LinkedIn or Twitter because every day he's putting out a thread with best tips on what to do and what to avoid in your prompts. So for instance, one that caught my attention was, you know, everyone stuck in beginner mode. Here are 10 techniques to get massively ahead with AI. And these are cut and paste prompts. So for instance, simulate an expert, kind of what like what Area 11 did. Um, challenge the the conventional narrative, which I think is actually an interesting take, telling ChatGPT to do the opposite. Now, remember, this doesn't always work. Maybe in GPT-4 version, where the, the parameters go from like billions to trillions, it'll get that much better, but sometimes it doesn't always get you the output that you want, which is also a recommendation to 
consistently iterate on your prompts in that chat. Uh, another example, use unconventional prompts, uh, ultra brainstormer, so it's easy to have chat GPT generate a list of potential topic ideas for your next project. Um, add in human written techniques. So he goes on, he tells you what to avoid. Check out everything that Rob is putting out. It's very smart. Finally, we are actually collecting our own library. We want to put together a really awesome, you know, collected library of chat GPT SEO prompts focused specifically on SEO. So if you have a moment, check out, we have a form in the description notes or on the page of the show site and submit your prompt for chat GPT for SEO. We're going to publish the whole library, make it available for everyone, even have a PDF that you can download. Highly appreciate if you can contribute to that. And we should hopefully have that out in the next couple of weeks. So thank you in advance for providing your chat prompts. It'll be cool. It'll be awesome. It'll be helpful. Okay. So when it comes to AI tools, obviously you have chat GPT already. There are a ton of other AI tools for content creation out there beyond chat GPT. In fact, um, Sam Shuan uh, on LinkedIn put together a really incredible car you know, carousel, but carousel list, uh, everything from text to image, text to voice, video creation, um, even some use cases in your business. So he's a great follow. Check out that carousel, which is linked in the description. And then on the SEO side of things, uh, Chris Kemper put together with AIPRM, the chat GPT prompt for SEOs Chrome extension. So you can install this Chrome extension. And then if you're on chat GPT, it'll help set you up with these prompts around adding links to articles, outranking articles, keyword strategy, keyword intent, and keyword clusters. So there you have it. So much AI chat GPT content. And if I'm being honest, we're probably going to be talking about it for the next few weeks, next few months, for the foreseeable future. Not necessarily just chat, chat GPT, but the way that AI content is ultimately going to influence SEO. So next Thursday, uh, we are hosting a webinar. I'm going to be joined by Andy Volpini of WordLift, who has been writing about AI generation for a while as well. I'm excited. The webinar is going to be all about AI content for SEO, how to avoid pitfalls and achieve success. This isn't going to be just strictly chat GPT. It's going to be all the different ways that you can use AI generation in your SEO processes. I'm super excited. We're going to talk about large language models, a little bit of the technical behind the scenes of how it all works. And then Andy's going to really dive into some of these strategies that you can use, practical ones that you can come away with and use and there will be a special download where i'm going to provide you even more chat ai content prompts yeah so that's going to be awesome definitely you can register it'll be free it's on january 26 at 12 p.m eastern St standard time eastern time are we eastern time eastern standard i hope you're there either way it's going to be Awesome. So speaking of WordLift, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that a couple of weeks ago, we had a really awesome guest blog post by Valentina Izzo all about e-commerce SEO, how to increase the visibility of your products by building a product knowledge graph. This was really cool because it talks all about structured data and how important it is to provide Google with the information about your products and their attributes to gain so much more visibility in the SERPs, whether it's through various enhancements showing up in the Google Shoppings tab, you name it, Valentina killed it. Plus, this isn't one of those use cases where you actually probably could get ChatGPT to start creating some of that structured data for you. Um, okay, okay, enough of the AI content, enough of the chat GPT. What an episode. It's so good to be back. We'll probably be back with more normal non-chat GPT SEO content starting next week. But I miss you guys. Thank you so much for watching. Once again, my name is Garrett Sussman. This is IPO Rank and the SEO Weekly. If you enjoy this, please subscribe, share it to someone who you think would get a kick out of it. All the resources are linked in the description or on the show page. I will catch you next week. Uh, have a great rest of your, rest of your week. Peace out.